But um, yeah, yeah, my name is Jyoti Fernandez. Yep. Um, so I have a small holding in Dorset, um, and I have run it and been part of it for the last 20 years, um, and lived previous to that at a community organic farm called Tinker's Bubble, which is a fossil fuel free community in Somerset. Now, I don't do that much of the farming myself. My three daughters are running the farm um, because I'm pretty much full-time working for Livia Campesina and the Land Workers Alliance, though I am back and forth to the farm all the time and my daughters line up all the sheep ready to trim their feet or whatever when I come back and then I zoom out again somewhere else. So just to coach that, but the farmers are running, operating, you know, um, mixed family farm um, in Dorset. Uh, there's two families there. There's a couple running the market garden. Um, my daughters are doing the sheep and cider apple pressing, which happened as a big collective. And my part of the farm, I'm making um, a into more of a collective um, type enterprise, I suppose, um, called the Land Skills Hub, which is an activism center for people engaged in land justice, uh, sharing land skills, climate activism that centers around um, food and land and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, all that work is happening on the farm and I'll talk to you a lot more about that. But what I spend most of my time now doing, um, based on the experience of having farmed for uh, nearly 30 years, uh, um, in this country um, on small scale farms um, that are mixed agroecological farms is working with the Land Workers Alliance. And we're a union that's for farmers, foresters, and land-based workers. I hope many of you have heard of the Land Workers Alliance. Have you heard of it? Yes. Yay, woo, yay, viva. <laughs> um, so uh, the Land Workers Alliance um, was started 10 years ago. I started it with a group of colleagues who were people who had all started farms or wanted to start farms um, and have them be small-scale enterprises or community-based enterprises based around selling food to their local economy or producing fuel or fiber if they were working in forests and, and sustainable woodland management as well, and realized that there was a lot stacked against you. You know, it was difficult to access land, it's difficult to have the training um, provided for people that want to start small scale agroecological enterprises. It particularly was 10 years ago, it's getting better now as our movement grows. Um, it, you know, it, the, the, the economics of what happens with farming and forestry is very difficult to earn a livelihood from, um, and that's something that's been happening happening globally, um, you know, all these things were really difficult and um, some of you may know before trying to work with the Land Workers Alliance um, alongside running the farm, I used to have um, an organization called Chapter 7 which used to provide planning advice to smallholders. So we worked a lot with trying to um, take a cases to court for planning permission um, of people that were, or to, to planning appeal, who, of people that wanted to build their own housing on sustainable small holdings and sustainable forestry enterprises and we're having difficulty with the planning system. Um, so <clears throat> on the back of that, knowing all of these issues that you know, smallholders faced in trying to earn a livelihood on the land and then live a livelihood that was in, in harmony with trying to live a lower impact lifestyle, more in line with people's values who wanted to, um, you know, you know, have radical simplicity as their statement of what they do to try and create a better world. You know, we felt like this is a basic human right. You know, people should be able to live on land, provide for themselves and their local community, and live a simple lifestyle if they want to. And it was something that was very, very difficult with our political system here. So um, the Land Workers Alliance, we started it um, as a union, as a part of a larger social movement, because that's historically how people come together to change things. People that have faced an issue that is, is fundamentally making it difficult to do what they do. They come together to fight for a wider structural change, but also to form solidarity with each other so that, you know, when things are fantastic, people celebrate together, and when they're really hard, you support each other in, in you know, those difficult times to be able to get through it, but feel like, you know, feel like you're part of something bigger than your, yourself or your individual enterprise, you know, feeling like whatever those difficulties we are f facing, we can collectively hold that difficulty together and we can come up with creative solutions for changing that and we can build collective power to actually change you know, the wider systemic issues that we face. And um, so the Land Workers Alliance was formed here in the UK to try and do that for land workers. 
and also to bring on board people who eat food and care about sustainable land management and care about a future for their kids, you know, because all of this fundamentally affects everyone. Everyone has to eat and we all have to survive uh, on this planet, you know, and so that means that the land needs to be managed in a sustainable way from generation to generation. So we wanted to bring people that are concerned about that and wanted to develop a vision for where we go with our future that's centered in the land and sustainable land management before you know, looking at the market as the solution to all these things and seeing how we can form ways of living as a society that's in better relationship to the land and not reliant on capitalism. So, you know, we feel like building that autonomy is the way we build the future that we can see being able to sustain itself for many generations. So now I don't spend so much time on my farm and I spend a lot of time traveling around <laughs> um, as part of Livia Campesina because um, we do a lot of advocacy here in the UK as part of the Land Workers Alliance and in Wales we have people that work with you know, the Welsh government um, and in England I work with the English government. I spend a lot of time going back and forth to Parliament and working with our agriculture department and similarly we have um, a campaigns lead in Wales that also works with Welsh government to try and change policies. Those things are things like what the agricultural policy looks like, what the environmental land management schemes look like. Um, what new entrance support schemes look like, what the grant systems for farmers look like. We look at trade regimes, how do cheap imports undercut producers here. You know, we think about how we holistically get access to healthy, affordable food for everyone. And that's the goal, you know, is that we want access to healthy, affordable food for everyone all across the UK, no matter what income level you are living with um, and where you live. So, you know, you know how, how do we actually access that food in places where there are real food deserts, where there's not fresh market gardens? You know, how do we access that food when people are on sub-minimal wages or zero-hour contracts? How do we actually make a food system that works for everybody and is based around local food? And that's not just across the UK, we mean globally as well. And we're part of La Via Campesina, which um, Ben spoke about. La Via Campesina is a really exciting organization to be a part of and I spend at least half of my time now advocating on behalf of La Via Campesina and organizing with La Via Campesina. So we represent 200 million small-scale peasant farmers and indigenous people around the world. Um, and 200 million is not a patch on how many there are. You know, it's so, so many people on this planet are small-scale farmers and they might have another livelihood alongside that, but they still have a subsistence small holding that provides for the majority of their food security. It doesn't look like that here in the UK. You know, most, of our, most people shop in supermarkets here. There is a local food economy, but there's you know, a lot of food that we import and that we get through these centralized systems. But if you look globally, 80% of global food security is provided through agroecological food webs by peasant farmers, indigenous people, and small-scale fisher people, and pastoralists. 80% of global food security is provided through those agroecological food webs. Now that's not what we hear about from multinational corporations. The big industrial farmers, the global food chains, Monsanto, Cargill, all these corporations, they use 70 to 80% of global resources for agriculture, the land, the water, you know, the, you know, the, the kind of monetary resources that are out there to support agriculture, but only provide for 20 to 30% of actual food security. So, the, you know, it's an incredibly huge difference between the work that small-scale peasant farmers, small and family farms selling to local food economies, your small-scale pastoralists, you know, you, you know and, and your small-scale fisher people are doing to sell through a variety of different ways. And a lot of it's actually subsistence, um, you, know, you know, supply and demand as well. So people at these, like, huge, vast outdoor markets. I just came back from Nigeria and was, you know, working with the farmers there there and you know went to these huge outdoor markets in Nigeria and you can start to picture it you can visualize it that you don't see here when you see that the majority of people are buying their food from 
a lot of women farmers, primarily, who are bringing their produce to the market, setting out little tables with, you know, some of the shellfish that they've gone and picked out of the riverbeds, or the um, tomatoes that they've grown, and you know, and they just have a little mound of them in a basket, or you know, uh, whatever it is, and then they feed their families first, and they, they you know, feed their extended families, and then they sell it at the local market, and everybody goes and buys from the local market. That is how the majority of the world is fed through these types of localized territorial systems that are based on the small-scale farm. Now, there's a lot of food that's produced by the industrial food chain, and by the industrial food chain, I mean the kind of farms that are consolidating small holdings into larger pieces of land, using a lot of inputs to grow things on a large, mo large monoculture kind of basis. So that's the kind of farms where there's a big tractor growing all of one kind of crop that's very uniform, using seeds that are genetically modified or hybrid, putting on pesticides and herbicides, um, and uh, artificial nitrate fertilizers, and then that uniform product is packed and sold often in very long global supply chain distances, you know, it might be on boats, it might be in lorries, it might be, um, you know, uh, air freighted even, you know, for different products, uh, but sold into to, uh, other, uh, other places, basically. And that's very different. The industrial food chain, we call it a chain because it's very linear, what happens to it. And those products are commodities rather than food that's, you know, grown through the blood, sweat and tears and the knowledge of, of people that within a locality of a wide diversity of different sorts of seeds and different ways of preserving things. That if, if you think of all the different cheeses and smoked meats and, you know, preserves and chutneys and ferments and things like that that come from traditional food cultures and the kind of diverse farming systems like in the West Country where I am, you know, a diverse farming system would be apple orchards with pears and plums of loads of different varieties, some of them cider apples and some of them cookers and some of them the kind of apples that you bottle and then sheep that are more your traditional varieties grazing underneath and black currants around the edges and uh, meadows you know that might have um, mixed grasslands that are mown for for traditional hay crops and then you know the cows you know might be milked and the milk goes to uh, make cheese and then the whey from the cheese goes to feed the pigs and and then there's a market garden that uses all the composted manure and you have this cyclical mixed system where everything's working together no waste in it because one part of the farm feeds into the other part of the farmer, farm and then you're looking after the soil. You're regenerating it. You're integrating trees so those trees are holding carbon in the soil and they're, you know, you know giving you fresh air to breathe. You know, it's, it's very diverse with different things being done over the seasons and that's the difference between a monoculture kind of farm and a mixed farming system. So around the world, these mixed agroecological farms were what provided the basis of food security pre-1950s and it was the majority of production around the world and now still provide the basis of food security but you've had the growth of the industrial food chain which has really been forced upon the planet and from the time of the Green Revolution and the Green Revolution was, was the time when uh, Norman Borlaug, this agricultural scientist, you know, it just started to create hybridized high yielding crops that used artificial nitrate fertilizers to grow and, and grew corn and wheat, you know, through these types of systems. Systems. You know, that got pushed on the planet through, um, <clears throat> through agricultural scientists and, and the Food and Agriculture Organization committing to this as being the dominant form of how we're going to feed the planet. Um, and then, you know, a, as countries converted to these kind of export-based, extractivist economies, um, you know, they took out loans from the IMF and the World Bank to try and create, you know, this conversion over to these different sor sorts of agriculture. And all the ports and all the roads and all the things that extract resources from the rest of the world were set up and people are still paying the debt off in all these countries, you know, where the loans would have been taken out for the hydroelectric jams, for the ports, for all the things to extract from their resources that are for the land that should be there to feed people in those countries, right? So this was happening in the 1990s all around, you know, out, you know up through to the 1990s, from the 1960s all around the world and it's still happening today. Um, but in the 1990s, around that time, there started to form the anti globalization movement, which was movements of farmers, 
indigenous people, people, landless people who had been dispossessed by their land being taken over by these kind of extractivist enterprises, you know, all around the world, realizing actually we have so much at stake here. This is our livelihood. This is our food security. This is our culture. All of this is fundamentally at stake. The more we take ourselves, we are uprooted from being on the land. People don't take themselves out of it. They're uprooted from it. They're forcibly removed from that and, and, and thrown into the globalized economy. Economy. And so La Via Campesina was formed around this time to say, we need to fight for something that's fundamentally different, which is food sovereignty to food security. Food security can be provided through a food sovereignty model, but food security, the way that it's looked at in the international spheres, is about trying to promote having enough calories to feed the planet. Well, we already have more than enough calories being produced through both types of food systems to feed the planet many times over, yet we still have many, many hungry people. We have many people who are malnourished, many people who are suffering from dietary related illnesses, from diabetes and you know, obesity and problems with ultra processed food being you know, the way that many people who can't afford really healthy food now because the way our economies are going are, are eating predominantly um, ultra processed food as well. So there's all these issues that have arisen from having these that, you know, food security that can be generated by pumping out loads of calories through this industrial farm model to the rest of the planet. And so La Via Campesina formed around this time and there's some amazing movements that I've been very lucky to be a part of um, helping support and work in solidarity with in, um, by being a part of Land Workers Alliance and in La Via Campesina. And uh, it's an amazing movement to be a part of. We work in 13 different regions around the world. Um, uh, the Euro I was part of the coordination of the European coordination for a little while and you know that was amazing movements like in France, Confederation Paysan and the peasant farming movements uh, across Eastern Europe, um, Eco Ruralis in Romania and you know all across you know, the Scandinavian countries and everywhere where, where people are fighting for their small and family farms and their traditional food cultures and, and looking for policies, agricultural policies that will continue to support those farms but we also operate in the, you know, all across Latin America, North America Africa, you know, um, you know Europe, Australia, and um, you know some of the founding movements. There's a couple I'll talk about because I thought that you know they give a flavour for what it's like. And I work very closely with these movements. You can ask me as many questions as you want. I can tell endless stories. I love it. Um, one was the Carnatican Farmers Movement. Um, was one of the founding members in the 90s. Uh, Karnataka um, is very special to me because my father was from Karnataka in India, and um, they have nearly 10 million farmers in just one state of India there, um, because, you know, in India, 60 to 70 percent, depending on where you're at in India, of people are farmers, small-scale farmers, and, you know, India has um, one of the largest dairy sectors in the world, but, it, you know, it, it's um, millions, literally millions, um, I think it's 90 million small-scale dairy farmers, maybe two cows each, you know, between one and three cows each, that produce this amount of milk. And so you have multiplicity of small-scale farmers producing at scale. It's mass production by the masses, right? And in, in Karnataka, you know, the farmers' movement there mobilized when they started to see that what was happening is, you know, as, as all these loans were being taken out to convert to different forms of agriculture that were based on export, the, the traditional mixed small holdings that were there in India were being consolidated to, to give way for these export farms, then farmers were losing loads of livelihood and there was economic systems globally that were happening, like the integration into the World Trade Organization, like forced liberalization of their agricultural policies because we wanted to enter into all these trade agreements with countries that don't let you protect your, your right to food, that don't let you protect, you, you know, fundamentally your small-scale producers or your right to be able to set prices that people can afford for food, etc. These are all policies which are there for governments to be able to protect basic human rights, right? But, but governments all over the world are being forced to dismantle that by being a part of the World Trade Organization. So they started to mobilize and they did things like whenever genetically modified crops were being planted there, they'd go en masse, thousands of farmers, and uproot the crops, you know, and they wear these green scarves because it's a social movement and people really identify with all being a part of this, this movement that the, is there to pro fundamentally protect their way of life. They'd uproot these crops. Or when there's World Trade Organization demonstrations, they turn out on mass in their tractors in town. Um, I was just there last year and talking to loads of 
women farmers in the field weeding loads of onions who could tell me what day the WTO negotiations were happening, what policies were being passed, <laughs> and that they were going to mobilize the next day um, to, to try and get out in the streets and, and block the streets in Mysore to, to mobilize against the World Trade Organization so that the Indian government wouldn't pass policies to allow in onions to be imported into the country that were going to undercut the prices of the onions they were trying to grow and sell at market, right? And, and you know, that's the way this kind of social movement operated, where en masse people are working through popular political education so that people know what is the system that they're up against and what do they need to fight to fight this globalization in order to protect their livelihood. So it's really interesting, and you might have heard about the Indian farmer protests that were happening where they were trying to, you know, change these laws, and they did win, they did succeed, um, that Modi was putting in to try and be able to enter into free trade agreements. And there's going to be more looming now that Trump's on the scene, <laughs> uh, because actually it was one with um, Trump that he, they, they mobilized against. But the UK is just as culpable, because the UK actually um, supported one of the consultancy firms that was hired to look at Indian policy to see what they needed to liberalize within their policy because the UK government is absolutely dedicated to liberalizing policy all around the world and if you have any questions what I mean by that you can ask later because I can go down a rabbit hole with economic agricultural policy <laughs> and that's probably not the most interesting thing we can talk about but you know I think it's 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 Interesting to note that these guys since the 90s have been mobilized and done this work through direct action to actually take control of, of their livelihood. Another really exciting organization that I've just been with in Zimbabwe um, uh, uh, was um, the, the farmers movement that formed there when they took the land back from the white farmers. And this might be quite controversial here because it was reported in many, many different ways. But when this happened, um, many, many... Um, people went and they took back land that was their ancestral land and set up settlements on this land and sometimes these were farms that were being geared up towards the export based economy and they resettled families who was their ancestral land back onto that land. And um, I went to go visit one of the agroecology schools there that was set up by La Via Campesina um, recently who um, had established it over the last 20 years now um, and there were 600 families settled on the land that had been three farmers um, farming that land and they replanted everything um, on there. All the farms were self-sufficient. They were working on this national seed program that they've been pushing through the government of, of Zimbabwe to try and bring back all the old traditional seeds um, because, you know, at, at like here, all across Africa, the big multinational corporations are trying to push for seed laws that don't allow you to save traditional seed varieties anymore because they don't meet the uniformity and conformity laws. They were pushing to reverse this and the, the Zimbabwean government had just passed a national seed um, program to try and encourage all the farmers to be saving the old seed varieties again. And I went to this amazing seed festival, which was just like a mile of stalls of different sorts of varieties of seed there that these farmers on all these different settlements, because you know, they took over the land in 70% of Zimbabwe in one night, right? So, so there's, this is a lot. There's settlement after settlement of people who've resettled onto small holdings in Zimbabwe. And they've been saving these traditional seed varieties because they're in the middle of drought there. It's serious drought. Um, and it's been, you know, drought for at least two years. Um, they've had like one rainfall in one of these parts in the last two years in this area. So they have to do a lot of water catchment. They have to do a lot of diversifying the farms, going back to the seed varieties that grow in dew-fed circumstances, where you know they grow just from the dew, so where they don't have to have irrigation. They have different varieties that can withstand whenever there's, the wind is really high as well, and they're going back to these varieties because they have to to survive. You know, they, you know, without this kind of adaptation and going back to these kind of varieties, they wouldn't have food because the, there's not a social security system there that supports people in these kinds of places. You know, they have to have land and grow food and, and give it to their local community and feed themselves and do this in the face of climate change that is getting worse and worse and worse. And luckily they've had the foresight to think about how do we do that. And if they hadn't reclaimed the land, 
they're like, what would, what would position would we be in now? Because the economic base is very unstable. There's not like much employment outside of agricultural sectors. It's really, really difficult. But um, you know, this was also a founding member of Bolivia Campesina. So often these, these social movements across the world that we're a part of this network of are really good at collective organizing <laughs> and really strong in, in, in survival. <laughs> you know, they know what to do in order to survive. And I think that's something we can learn from here in the UK. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of the other collective organizing I've see, seen because it's really, really interesting, you know, just to know that, you know, as time goes on, we may have a lot of food we can import from different places now. Um, you know, we have social security systems now. This may not go on, you know, in the next 20 years. And we need to think about what we start doing to adapt to the volatility, the the changes that are going to happen both politically and in terms of the environment now and think about how we start getting access to land, knowledge and skills to be able to survive and, and from the point of view of the Land Workers Alliance and the work that I do, that's knowledge and skills about how to farm, how to manage forests, how to build homes, you know, and, and how to live as community and, and do things in ways that aren't dependent on international global supply chains all the time. Because that, that is security, to know that we have something we can fall back on. And um, yeah, it, it's amazing to be a part of a movement. Here in the UK, what we're doing with Land Workers Alliance is to think about that really strategically and try and help government to see that big picture in a better way, but also, also to work through popular education. Everybody should understand how our food system works, how our land, use, uh, our, our land use system works, because if we all understand it, then we're able to kind of chip in in the best way possible to make this happen. You know, it is up to us to survive at the moment and for our, for our next generation. So we do need to be active about really understanding these things. Um, and we've just done a report that we're going to release shortly, 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 hopefully, um, that my daughter's been working on forever um, and, and, and the Land Workers Alliance has been debating about forever, which is is a land use modeling report. And we were looking at um, how much land we have here in the UK, what we need to be growing in order to be able to feed ourselves sustainably as the, the population increases. Um, and, you know, and, and then you know, thinking a little bit how we get to that, that, that place so that we can be somewhat self-sufficient in food. I mean, the UK is a very small island with a very dense population. So if, if we can do at least a percentage of that kind of food self-sufficiency self here, um, you know, other places that are much bigger, they can stand a chance too. But there's 17 million hectares of agricultural land in the UK. And we were looking at what the projected population, which is around 70 million, will need in order to be able to feed themselves, looking at what kind of crops um, will be resilient to climate change and diversified mixed farming systems. And that's agroecology, you know, and, and what I'm, we mean by diversified systems and why they're more resilient is that if you have a lot of different sorts of crops grown on a field, you know, in a field or in, on a farm, some years you'll have loads of rainfall and it'll be really, you know, it's going to be really weird seasons from now on in. I mean, I don't think there's going to be much predictability, you know, and if it rains really hard, some crops might survive when it rains really hard. But then there might be a year where you get droughts in funny patches as well, and there'll be other crops that survive during droughts. And you want short season varieties so that they come to fruition really quick, but maybe some stuff that's a little bit longer as well. You know, you, you basically don't want to put all your eggs in one basket because you, we don't know what's going to happen from year to year anymore. So we have to come up with farms where you know some stuff is not going to work, some years, but then other things will. And, and that way we have some resilience. And you know, we need to think about how we start to do that by design, <laughs> by design, you know, now, because we know, we know already there's gonna be temperature rises and it's gonna get more chaotic. And so with this land use plan, um, we were looking at, at how much we'd need of what kind of food crops in order to feed the projected population. And then so we can think about, and government can start to think about, and we can start to think about how much we need to plant of, of whatever it is. Um, and from what we were looking at, if we're going to plant more forest, because we do need more forest, we need more timber that's not imported from places, we should stop exporting to timber to China. That would help as well. Um, and that's also to sequester carbon. Um, if we're going to plant a bit more forest um, and have woodland workers, we're not talking about you know rewilding everything. We're talking about getting managed working woodlands where people are employed working in those woodlands, right? Um, and then um, having enough grain 
proteins, um, some dairy, some meat, you know, all the vegetables we want and thinking about doubling um, vegetable consumption. And we were looking at doubling pulse production as well, so people eat a lot more pulses as well. And, and thinking about the different land use categories we need. Now, in order for people to be fed, um, because meat is a very inefficient use of land, then it looks like we'd need to reduce the amount of meat production by about 75% to be able to fit everything in. But it was also important to have some livestock within the system in terms of nitrogen balance, um, in terms of the grazing for conservation meadows, and in terms of wildlife um, conservation for the sorts of things that we wanted there. And when we were looking at pigs and chickens, um, them only being fed on co-products, byproducts, and waste products of other foods that are being grown for human consumption. So um, if you're interested in that, you can see a film we just put out called Soy No More in, in the, um, in the, from the Land Workers Alliance, which looks at how we can feed pigs and chickens um, using co-products, byproducts, and waste products of beans and pulses being grown here in the UK and doubling the production of that so we can do that. So it, meant, it means dietary change. It means shifting some areas that are being used in one way to other forms of production. But overall, we still have a lot of people working on the land. You know, this does not mean less farmers. This means more farmers, many more farmers, and an economy that is just rolling and hopping and popping with people doing all this stuff. You know, it's about a sustainable economy that is like got all these layered, mixed, diverse enterprises. A lot more community engagement. Uh, you mix farms in different places where the vegetables aren't grown all, all on the peatland. You know, someplace and restoring that peatland where the vegetables are actually grown as part of mixed farming uses. More people are brought into these large farms, so they're broken up into smaller units that are working in these cyclical systems. So um, that's just a little intro to the land use report, but that's what I'm talking about, about thinking strategically about what we do to survive. And this has to be done on a planetary-wide basis. And the same kind of idea of diets changing globally also applies because we don't have enough arable land to feed the whole world agroecologically and we, we want to promote agroecological farming that's without pesticides, herbicides and nitrate fertilizers, then we need to shift diets so that people are eating more seasonally, more locally, more diverse, less meat consumption. And when we say that, we're not talking about the livelihoods of small-scale dairy producers, small-scale meat farmers, the ones that are, have livestock integrated into a system where they're eating the waste, they're part of generating the fertility, et cetera, like peasant farming systems all over the world are. That's just getting rid of factory farms. Because factory farms, these virtually, vertically integrated, and by that I mean farms that are controlled by multi multinational corporations like Cargill. And I know there's a lot near here on the river. Why? There are a lot of chicken farms that are owned by Cargill. Cargill imports soya, and the soya comes from the Amazon. Uh, I see Sam back at the back here. <laughs> and we heard all about it. We went to the Amazon together um, and, and, and spoke with the Kayapo, who are protecting you know, 12 million hectares of land there. And we made a little film with them who were basically pleading with people not to eat the products, they said, it's, 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 it's our blood, basically, when you are taking soya out of the Amazon and putting it into the, to, to animal production here. But it's not benefiting people here. It's, it's you know, being imported by Cargill and then going into these vertically integrated chicken farms, which are owned by Cargill, and the farmers are contracted to, you know, to raise those chickens. And then... Um, Lots of effluent and pollution goes into the rivers. You know, you get all the byproducts um, that are terrible for the environment um, from these chicken farms. And then that chicken's exported. So we just wrote a letter, an open letter to Daniel Zeichner because they announced within DEFRA that they were doing this trade deal to export loads of chicken. It's a great deal for UK farmers. We're going to export loads of chicken to South Africa. Uh, you know, the, his uh, predecessor, you know, had done this trade deal to export loads of chicken to Mongolia. None of this is about food supply. So it's not going to, to uh, um, promote food security here. The chicken's being exported. Um, you know, it comes from the Amazon, the feed that's going into these chickens, uh, polluting the landscape of our natural environment here, and then going and exporting somewhere else that's undermining their producers in that country. And most of it goes to Kentucky Fried Chicken, because everywhere I've bloody been in the world, there's Kentucky Fried Chicken in the weirdest places in the world. And that undermines local food cultures, local producers, um, creates dietary related, you know, 
illnesses in those countries as well. None of this is about a sustainable food system, and it's not good news for UK farmers. So, you know, advocating for a system where we think about it in the whole is incredibly important at this point in time. And I would also encourage all of you to demonstrate against those factory farms. Um, we've put out a guide called How to Stop a Factory Farm. <laughs> it's an act activist um, manual if you're interested in, in more details about it, but um, any activist wanting to work on this, I think it's really important because it's one of those pieces we've got to shut down the factory farms in this kind of corporate controlled um, systems because they're, they're so destructive and they use too many resources. So. Um, I just wanted to just spend a little bit of time just saying a few depressing things. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'll say a lot of more hopeful things <laughs> afterwards. But um, yeah, so uh, you know, now part of my work for Olivia Campesina is acting as a negotiator on behalf of Olivia Campesina at the climate change talks. Um, I've just been invited to the meeting in it's in the Philippines, and I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I have to fly all over the place to do this work. But at this point in time, I feel like it's a bit of an emergency situation. So we're just trying to do what we can. Um, every time we're at these talks, it, it's very, very apparent that we're not going to be able to act in time unless we really, really get on the case to, to deal with adaptation. Um, and you know, I find it just incredibly daunting the task ahead of us to transition to the place we need to be in order to avoid any certain amount of warming. But I think it's very, very clear that we are definitely headed towards a significant amount of global warming. So we are going to have to adapt and shift. And climate adaptation is the most important thing at this point in time. Now, the food system is at the heart of it, right? The food system is responsible for 30 to 40 percent of global emissions. Um, it's also responsible, and this is the industrialized farming system, the industrialized food chain, not the agroecological food webs. That's the solution, right? Uh, but uh, and, and in some places, they've lost 60 up to 80 percent of insects because of pesticides from the industrial food chain. This is serious. This, it's really, really serious. That is verging on global collapse if we don't deal with the industrialized food system at this point in time. And, and so the alternatives that are there um, that come from the agroecological ecological food webs, which are dominant, they're all over the place, they know what to do, right? They need to be uplifted to be able to be made visible in the solutions that they provide for how we feed the planet, restore the biodiversity, bring down global temperatures, and, and, and stop these emissions from happening right, um, for, uh, around the world. And um, that's something that I'm working a lot on at the moment, is uh, um, trying to work with two strands of funding that are coming through the climate change talks. There's the climate adaptation funds and loss and damages. And loss and damages is there to deal with the people who are at the forefront of, of the battle against climate change have been most impacted in the world by fossil fuel extraction, um, by, by global temperature rises, um, but are the least responsible, right? Um, and so these are two processes that, that are a little bit overlooked because there's a lot of people campaigning on trying to stop oil and transition from um, fossil fuels, etc., which is all incredibly important, incredibly important. We have to stop it. But adaptation is our global food security, right? If we do not adapt to these rises in temperature and, and transition to a system where more people are able to be fed, it, it could be collapse, collapse of our global food systems. It is extremely important to think about that right now and where loss and damages and adaptation fit in. And we're in the belly of the beast in many ways, right? We're all in a place where we have benefited, no matter what income level we are, from living in a place that has benefited from fossil fuel extraction, from the wealth that was generated from it, even if it's trickled down, right? And, and so we need to speak out in terms of those policies. And there are governments um, that are donating to loss and damages to the climate adaptation finance. It's um, a lot of the Scandinavian countries, Germany, but the UK does donate quite a lot. The US, I don't know what's going to happen with them, but they donate a lot and they're dominating the talks. And um, what, what happened last year, it got announced that it was going to be the World Bank that rolls out loss and damages. Fund. Now, that's really problematic and a bit difficult because, like I spoke about before, the World Bank is who gave out all these loans so we can set up this whole industrialized food system and puts everybody in debt. And Global South campaigners, people all across Africa and Latin America and places that are suffering in the face of climate change, um, they're saying, well, we don't want to be taking out loans to do this. This is, this is reparations. You know, you owe us the chance to, to transition from this. And so we do need to speak out about these issues, and there's a lot that we can do. Um, 
Uh, recently, I'm spending a lot of time in Africa at the moment, but because we're, it's just because we're trying to consolidate the proposals on this kind of thing. I just came back from Nigeria. I was there till um, last week um, to, uh, from um, Port Harcourt, which was the place where the Agoni tribes people were deeply impacted by Shell Oil Corporation and the oil extraction that's happened there. And I literally had such a terrible cough, you know, leaving there, loads of headaches, everything. You could just smell the oil thick in the air. A Shell or Oil Corporation has not done a single thing, and I have not felt this angry in a really long time. I mean, it was awful, and the poverty was just appalling for a place that has extracted billions in wealth from, from there. You know, it's literally, you get out of, you know, the taxi, and, and there'd be four people lined up with a patched umbrella to walk you across the road to get, like, 20p, you know. People are so poor there, uh, in, in a place where, you know, Billions is being extracted, and we're all benefiting from you know that fossil fuel extractive economy somewhere. And the farmers there have mobilised. Um, uh, Thirteen thousand of them have just won the right to take Shell to court in the UK court system. So they tried in the US court system. They've tried in lots of other places um, to try and get it heard. And the UK court system has just allowed them to take it to court. So that's going to be happening over the next year. And we can really act in solidarity with them to try and turn up outside the courts, speak about it, like talk about you know, what's happening to them to support them through that court case. But also, we're going to try and take it as a first pilot test case in loss and damages as well, so that the grassroots organization there of farmers that are forming networks there. They're making a plan for cleaning up their soil, for rebuilding the fertility, for planting agroforestry and everything. But they're doing this with no financial support whatsoever. And that's, that oil is so polluted. The water that comes out of their taps is 900 levels of the, you know, 900 times the level of benzene uh, that's legal limits, right? And, the, and there's so much cancer. Their average lifespan is 35 years old there because of the amount of cancer from all this sort of stuff. And so they want to lead on a, a, a cleanup program that actually bring, brings money back into their economy. But that's the sort of thing we can speak up about and be like, Loss and damages, yes, and it needs to go to the farmers, not to corrupt governments that are just going to pull this off. But what happens when you go to these talks is the multinational corporations, they turn up and say, we've got climate smart agriculture, we've got all these genetically modified varieties that are adaptable to climate change, we're going to feed the planet where everything else collapses. It's, it's lies, basically, and they're taking 90% of the budget for climate adaptation. It's multinational agribusiness companies taking most of the budget, when all these grassroots groups on the ground are the ones that should be doing the work to restore the planet, bring back the biodiversity, bring back the soils, clean up all this pollution. So we, we do need to speak out on that. We do need to act in solidarity, and there is a lot we can do from here. You know, stop these factory farms, speak out on loss and damages, educate ourselves about like the global politics of the food system. It's all things we can do. Um, and then, Another depressing thing, but I just wanted to put that out there, is that in, they're expecting by 2050 1.2 billion climate migrants. So that's people where the, the, um, <clears throat> the, the where their conditions, where they live, will no longer allow them to have a viable livelihood there, and they're going to need to move to other places. And if we think about the impact that will have social politically with, with huge amounts of migrants com coming across and many, many trying to come to Europe. Um, and, you know, just the, the, the human suffering that could happen if we don't pre-plan and think about this ahead of time. It's really important that we speak up now about the climate migration issue. And it's not something we think about in our daily lives, but it will impact us in our daily lives if this goes on without us thinking about it. And there are solutions that are starting to come up through the grassroots movements, through La Via Campesina, through civil society, to think about resettlement camps and resettling people in ways that's humane and promotes dignity and gives people access to land that they can replant trees on and build houses on in places that will be more likely to be safe from the impacts of climate change, or at least, you know, they can set up these diverse farms and try and, try and be in those places. And that's an important thing that we need to think about investing in now, rather than later there being more and more race riots, more and more trying to keep the migrants from coming across, you know, from Tunisia and these boats that sink and all this kind of disaster that we could be looming with all of this. And also in terms of global food security, because, you know, we, you know, many of these are the peasant farmers that are now currently, you know, 
feeding 80% of our planet. And, and so I just wanted to put that out there as something that we could all start acting on. And whether it's through grassroots solidarity, you know, can a group locally support financially a camp to get set up in another part of the world? Do we have civil brigades? Do we actually work together as humanity in a collective way to, to create the solutions that we can? Because we can. And I feel like we are in one of the most important times in history. We are in a, at a juncture where you know, it's, it's an incredibly important time to be alive, where you can really make a lot of difference in what happens if you actually go back to the land and you can live a life this way. You know, many, many people have lived on the land uh, over time, you know, whether it's a viable career path or not, it is actually a life for, that you can sustain and create community food plans and, you know, then think how do we work together as part of a social movement to support the places that are going to be feeling these impacts so that we have structures that can go and help and financially support and share knowledge and give that like moral support to people as, as things start to fall apart because we you know not only are the skills in, on the land important but that collective organizing that sense of solidarity that sense of duty that sense of love deep love for each other and the earth is the most important thing we can nourish at this point in time and it it's one of the most exciting times in history, too, because we've got, you know, education levels that are higher than any point in history. You know, we've, we've got the ability to communicate ideas and share knowledge. You know, when I talk to young people now, the, the ideas and things that they understand about communication, about neurodiversity, about relationship, about love, all these things are so exciting because that's different from when I grew up and people were like, you know, just straight up racist all the time. <laughs> at least... <laughs> At least somebody call it out now, you know? And, and, but that can go alongside like understanding different economic systems. We can be so much more creative about setting up cooperatives and alternative e economic models that aren't totally capitalist and extractivist and leave shitty places on the other side of the planet that we just completely ignore, you know, and pretend those hell holes don't exist, you know? We, we, that, we can do something different now and we can regenerate biodiversity. That, you know, we're at a point where that can all happen and we can have a really exciting place that we move to in the future, but we do have to feel that power in ourselves and hold that collectively together to be able to make that happen. So La Via Campesina is a really exciting social movement that is trying to create those alternatives, and almost nobody knows about it, <laughs> but it is, it, it's there and it's people who are every single day working together with the land and trying to create these alternatives. And we can follow those models and collectively organize. There's one um, organization called Movimiento Semtera that I admire ever so much that was also a founding member of La Via Campesina who now is just growing in strength in Brazil. And um, they've been organizing since the 90s with landless people and they use popular education to help people come together to think about the world that they want and how you collectively organize for it. And what they achieve is so exciting. They're like the kindest army in history, you know. And they do um, land occupations in Brazil where there's... Um, agribusiness um, happening. So there might be like big fields that are full of genetically modified sugar cane or whatever. And they'll, they see that as you know, land that's being underutilized for the common good. And through a lot of time having a socialist government in Brazil before Bolsonaro came in and now Lula's back, you know, they had gotten into the Brazilian constitution something, a clause that said um, if land is underutilized for the common good and you can prove that in the court of law, then that can be give, granted to people that will utilize it better for the common good. And so they organize around this concept and they talk to landless people, you know, many in favelas, a lot of people who are totally illiterate, people who have been, you know, com completely thrown out of, of any like um, wealth within the capitalist system, right? And, and get people to organize to go and occupy that land. And so they might go 2,000 people at a time and pull up all the crops on that land, set up a settlement, establish themselves. They give pre-training to all the people in farming, um, start, uh, give them investment capital, um, tractors, um, and then they have collection systems and people set up on 10 hectare plots in hectares of cl clusters of 10, and then there's 10 of 10, right? So that there, there's this system that goes from the small family farm level to collective organizing on a cluster level, all the way up to like the big, the big group. And then those big groups on the settlements then work with the national organization. And they will collect all the produce from those different small family farms 
Um, and 70% of what they collect goes to the public procurement system. So there's these amazing collection warehouses where they have boxes full of produce, that, uh, you know, fresh lettuces and apples and, you know, all the different kinds of fruit and vegetables going out to the public schools and, and, and feeding kids, you know, fresh, organic, family farm grown food. Um, and then some of it goes to shops that are in the big cities like in San Paolo, etc. Some of it goes to big processing centers where they make sugar and rice and, and, and beans and all the staple products. Lots of that produce goes to feed hungry people. So they do food kitchens in most of the major cities. Um, and, and then some of it is exported, like 10% of it is exported. Um, but, um, and that income from the export comes back into the movement so that they can have startup capital for all the new landless people that they bring into the movement to reoccupy on another piece of land. And it's this incredible social movement with a huge amount of organization around a collective vision of land management and democracy and a just and equitable society. And you know, it's, it's, it's magical to watch. And I feel like we could really learn from that in this country. We've had so many years of neoliberal theory you know, sort of saying, you got to do it on your own. You got to start your own enterprise just on your own. You, all, the only choices you can make are what you can buy with your own pocketbook. It's all about individual choice that gets reinforced by this neoliberal system that pushes against this idea of collective organizing in a way that's non-capitalist, that's non-exploitative, that is about a just and equitable society that also manages the land in a way that's sustainable for generations to come. And yeah, let's do it. Let's just do it. <laughs> that's it. Thank <laughs> you.